You know, the last, uh, this is our last week of our five-week series taken from the Minor Prophets. And we called it, you know, Major Messages from the Minor Prophets. And remember, they're called minor not because their message is not important, but because the, how short their letters, their books are, which is a good thing. Uh, today, we're talking about Malachi. He's the last of the Minor Prophets. Uh, if you want to go ahead and start turning there, and tell you the easiest way to find it. Go to Matthew chapter 1 and go backwards a few pages, and that's Malachi, because it's just four chapters long, and that's how you find it. Last, it's very unique as well, that after Malachi was sent by God to Israel and spoke to the people on God's behalf, it was 400 years of silence. No angels, no prophets who came and spoke to Israel. 400 years of silence. The next person on the scene, the next voice or word from God was the birth of Jesus Christ. And that was when that took place. So, you know, if you look at the minor prophets or the prophets in general, they're pretty in your face. I mean, their, their message is just right, hard truth and all. And so it's, it's easy sometimes if you just listen to that or read that, you just picture an angry God. But if that's what you're seeing, you've missed, missed the major messages of the prophets. You know, we looked at some things. We looked at warning uh, of coming disaster as one of the greatest forms of love. And that's what these prophets were doing. It's what God sent them to, to warn the people, to get your life back, turn back to God. You know, you think about the tragedy with uh, Hurricane Harvey. Now imagine that the National Weather Service, the Weather Channel, said, yeah, that's a bad one coming, but let's don't tell anybody. That'll just upset everybody's name, name, or day, and everybody will get all upset. It's a tragedy as it is, but can you imagine how much worse would have been with no warning. So the prophets sent word to turn back to God. It's hard to recognize sometimes, but this is one of the greatest forms of love is when we warn somebody of coming disaster. We looked at how desperate we are to know God can be measured by how seriously we take the sin in our life. If you want to know God, you want to be close to God, then you have to deal with the sin in your life. And that's why we talked about the necessity of repentance. The prophets was about repentance, turn back to God. You know, we, we had to do that. We saw that the most in the midst of a lot of suffering and pain, some that we bring on ourselves and some it's totally uh, just not our fault, that it's easy to sometimes lose sight of God's big story. And we get caught up in just our little story. And Eric talked about that last week, about the pain and suffering, and that we don't need to, uh, to lose our trust in God. Uh, that he, we just got to trust that he has a far greater outcome uh, for the kingdom involved in this. And most of all, we should have learned that God's love is a stubborn love. It is a stubborn love. He just keeps calling us back. Y'all keep com Come on back. He never gives up on us. He just says, just keep on coming back. God's love is so powerful that you can't push him away so far that you can't find your way back to him. Now, we can choose not to accept his love, but we cannot push him so far away that his love cannot find us again. Well, I feel like a lot of you recognize these. If you went to uh, high school and college, Cliff's, Cliff's Notes. I can see some of you smiling. You got through college on these. I know. You know it, what it is, they're, they're books that were written. If you were, had to read a big, thick book for a class, you could go get Cliff's Notes, and it's a summary and all the important things out of the book. Uh, you know why they're called Cliff's Notes? Because the publisher who came up with this idea, his name was Clifton Hilligus. And he says that he came up with the idea not to get us to not read the books, but to spark our interest so we'd want to read the books. I think we got that backwards. I, I, I think we didn't follow his reasoning there. There's one verse that I want to read here in Malachi. That it's just one verse. It captures the theme of Malachi, and it really captures the major theme of the old, one of the major themes of the Old Testament. And I'm not suggesting that you just read this one verse and don't read uh, the rest, but uh, because Malachi has only four chapters, and one of those chapters is very short. So you should, you should be able to read that. Out. But in Malachi chapter 3, verse 7, this is kind of a theme verse here. Malachi 3, 7 says, Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me. And I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. 
And if you know the history of Israel, that uh, this nation began with one man, Abraham, and he promised him to be a great nation. And as it went through that, they, uh, their, their nation grew and, and then it ended up in Egypt. And then Moses led them out of Egypt and Joshua led them into the promised land. And eventually they became the greatest nation on the earth under David and Solomon but soon after that sin began to come in and they really declined as a nation eventually they were conquered by other kingdoms uh, and they were exiled and taken to other lands but God always saved or brought back a remnant of people so the nation would always exist so but then something very interesting happens in Israel because the people were so scarred by the exile and so scared it would happen again that they made vows and commitments to God that they would never go away from him again. You read Ezra and Nehemiah, you find those commitments and vows that they made. But then something happened as well. It started off well that they were keeping these commitments and vows they made to God. But then it became where they kept them on the outside. They did all the right things, but on the inside, they just had no love, no compassion for mankind or for God. And it was during this time that the Pharisees and Sadducees came into prominence because they were very hyper-religious. Uh, they kept every law, but there was nothing inside. Jesus talked about that when he came. You remember when he was talking to the Pharisees one time, he said, you're nothing but whitewashed tombs. You know what he meant by that? He said, you can paint them up on the outside and make it look good. The tomb can be awful pretty. He said, but inside nothing's changed. It's just dead man's bones. So Jesus talked about the same thing. Malachi has a very unique delivery style that he has here. If you'll notice, we read, notice we read through here, he has an imaginary conversation with Israel. And he goes on and asks the questions that Israel would ask even before they had a chance to say them. Like in the verse that I, we read just now. I left off that last little line there. He says, uh, he says, but you ask, how are we to return? And Malachi is always just thinking a step ahead of the question they would ask. And this wasn't a sincere question. They were saying, return? We never went anywhere. You see, this is the danger of God, obeying God on the outside but nothing on the inside. Just going through the motions and doing as little as we can get by with to make sure we're okay with God. We become blind to our faults. We become blind to our sins because we judge everything on the outside. If I look okay on the outside and I say the right words and I do the stuff, the right things in front of people, then it doesn't matter what's inside and what happens in secret because I'm doing everything right. And there's a real danger in that. And what Malachi, what I want to do with Malachi today is just uh, highlight some of the things that he says that they've become blind to in their lives. First one's in Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, and it deals with their worship, how the worship had become empty. Malachi 1, 6 says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where's the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is you, O priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? See, there's another question. And then if we drop down to verse 8, it says, When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now you notice he addresses this to the priest, but it was the people who were bringing the sacrifices. And you were, they had agreed to, and God had commanded to, to bring your best animal to sacrifice. But they were bringing the least, the least desirable. If they had one that was diseased or dying or crippled, that's what they were bringing. But he addresses this to the priest for this reason. They accepted the sacrifices. They went along with the people, and they should have been saying, no, you're not keeping the law that you promised to follow. Bring your best animals and your best sacrifice. And so he, he, he says this to the priest, and if he says a lot of other things to the priest that we can take and apply to ourselves. That's why you need to read this yourself. You see, this worship was half-hearted. 
as little as they could slip by with and didn't want to cost them too much. Now, you know, personally speaking, for me, you know, I was raised uh, a mother who said, you're going to church, we're going to church. It was never a question. You never, it was never asked, Mom, are we going to church? You know, because you were going. I mean, that was just it. So, and, and so my, that's the foundation of my life. So I, I've been in church basically every Sunday of my life, I think. That's what's natural to me. And so I understand that. But for a Christian who is, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not poking at anybody. I'm just saying a Christian who is sporadic in their attendance, I just wonder what your thought, pro, what the process, thought process is. That I'm going to come these three and then miss four, come one, miss two, three. How do you decide which ones are the ones to come on? How do you decide which is important and when it's time to go back to church? And I, it's the same with tithing. From the time I was a little boy, if you got a dollar for something, I was taught 10 cents of that you need to put in the offering plate. That's a tithe. That's 10%, Greg. And you got money for chores, a little odd jobs. I was taught that. So it's never been a question for Janice and I. We tithe, we, and, and we try to build on the tithe. In other words, go above it. And, but for the sporadic giver, how do you decide when it's time to give? How do you decide that it's not okay to give at these times or not to give what God has said but only give this little bit? You know, it's how do you do that? You know, I like Malachi here. He makes it a very practical life illustration. He says, hey, try giving these gifts to the, to the governor. See if he likes you. And the way I look at that is try giving a gift like that to someone you love. Guys, buy your wife a toolbox for Christmas. Get your wife a, a lawnmower for her anniversary. Get her, some, uh, get, get her some golf clubs for her birthday. And see how that goes over. And what Malachi is saying here, he says, it doesn't work. This is an insult that you would do this to me. I feel like every one of us will donate to the victims of Hurricane Harvey. Uh, th that's, that's what we're going to do. But how many of us will sacrifice for them. I, now I'm not belittling because we need to give every dollar we can and every dollar we give is going to help people. But for Janice and I, we're going to give, but I'm going to be totally honest with you. It's not going to change our lifestyle. It's not going to hurt so bad that it's, we're going to have to give up something to, to give. C.S. Lewis said that one of the best gauges uh, if what you're giving is a true sacrifice to God is if it changes your lifestyle. Does it cost you something? Does it change what you're able to do because you want to give him something or give him the most you can? You see, our offerings should say to the world that God is number one, and I want everybody to know it. And want people to say, wow, if you love God that much that you would give up this or give up that or give this much, then he must really be something. Well, one of the other areas that they had become blind to was in their, I'll say in their commitments and their responsibilities. Uh, Malachi 2.11. Malachi 2.11 says, Judah has broken faith. A detestable thing has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Judah has desecrated the sanctuary the Lord loves by marrying the daughter of a foreign god. Now, why did God use such strong language about marrying someone from another nation? This is very interesting. One, he had commanded them not to, and they agreed to it, but now they were doing it. But right there it is. He said, marrying the daughter of a foreign god. Israel was the only nation on the face of the earth whose God was Jehovah God. Only one. Everybody else had false gods that they had created and worshipped these gods. So when he says this, if you married someone from another nation, you automatically were uniting with false god worship. And, it, and God's saying, no, I don't want you to do this. There's, there's a danger in this. Uh, go on down to verse 14. So here's, he's, he's a, I assumed another question. They said, you know, why doesn't God accept our offerings? And he says in verse 14, you ask why? 
It is because the Lord is acting as a witness between you and the wife of your youth, because you have broken faith with her, though, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Now, some scholars say there's no connection where he talked about the false gods marrying someone from a foreign nation and this statement here about, uh, about divorce. I think it's a very natural flow here. But either way you take it, you can see what's taking place. Here are the men of Israel that have become so enamored, so attracted to the women of other nations, other cultures, that they're, by, they're ignoring or even divorcing the God-fearing women of Israel and going after these other women. And God is saying, no, that, he said, that's, that, that is not what I wanted, he said, that's not what I have for you. See, God had a plan for Israel, and they were to represent God's goodness to the world, and they were to raise up each generation to do the same thing, to know and to worship and tell about God, each generation. But when these men, these husbands and fathers are going and marrying women from other lands and then infiltrating the worship of false gods in with Jehovah God. And you want to read some really weird stuff. It's seeing the latter years of Israel's a nation and Judah's a nation, how they had inger, intermingled, taken some of the pagan god worship and the god worship of God and mixed them together. And you're going, man, no wonder, it's no wonder God didn't just wipe them off the face of the earth. But they, he knew this was what was going to happen. So he says, don't do this. But with the men acting this way, the worship of God was watered down and defiled. The generations, their children, they didn't raise, raise up to know or have a true picture of who God was. You see, the breakdown of the family was a problem then. It's a problem now. And all of us need to take our commitments and our responsibilities serious. And we need to prepare the next generation for life. In some cases, a very hard life. And we need to do a better job as husbands and as wives. You know, divorce is always a hard topic to preach on because you've got 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and I'm talking to you, and you don't get to say anything back. And divorce, you know, it's, situations are so different, and there's so many things to consider. Uh, and I... You know, and I think about my family. It, 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 divorce has touched so many. I think just in my family. My mom and dad were divorced. My sister divorced. Had two uncles on my mom's side. They were both divorced. And the one aunt who didn't, she was miserable every day of her life because of the husband she was married to. He was such a bad guy. It's, you know, it's touched all of us. And a lot of times when you talk about divorce and, and maybe you've been divorced or your daughter or son's divorced, whatever, you kind of feel like you're being piled on. We're dragging up the past and being judgmental of, you know, and you feel like that. And that's not the point here. We can't go back and undo the past. We can't go back. You know, what we're trying to say here is, is that God has set some ideals and let's try to live up to them. No matter where you've been right now, live up to those ideals the very best you can. Live up to your commitments the best you can. Raise the next generation to get a true look of what God is about. We can't go back, but we can go forward, is what we're trying to say here. Another area of blindness uh, caused by just focusing on the outside is in the area of our beliefs and our trust. Uh, Malachi 3, verse 13. Malachi 3, 13. Starts this way, he says, You have said harsh things against me, says the Lord, yet you ask. Here's another one of those questions. What have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Eric did an excellent job last week talking about you know, that in times of our life, and when we're in some tough spots, that we sometimes go, God, where are you? I don't understand. And that's not what's happening here. It, doubt sometimes is a good thing because it gets us to look deeper, and we look harder at our life, and we look deeper at God. 
Now, that's not what he's talking about. But what is happening here is that these people have looked around and said, you know, this just isn't fair. These guys are getting away with it, and these people live here getting away with it, and here I am trying to serve God, and I'm tired of it. So I'm going to get all I can can. I'm going to get all the gusto I can. I'm going to do the things they're doing because they're better off than I am. Oh, we're still going to call God our God. We're still going to go to the temple, and we're going to do all those things, but I'm not going to live the way God wants to. I'm going to live like they're living because they got a better deal. That's what they're saying here. You see, eventually it leads to an attitude towards God like this next verse. And I've, I, I put it up in the New Living Translation because it really, it really kind of it says it in our language how we would say it today. Malachi 1.13. Malachi 1.13. He says, You say it's too hard to serve the Lord, and you turn up your noses at my commands, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Yeah, can't you picture that? That when you're reading, you see what God's command is on something, you just, I'm not going to do that. That makes me too uncomfortable. That costs too much. And we curl up that nose and I'm not doing that. And that's what he's saying here. You see, the sin is not trusting God despite all that he's already done for you. But this is the result of it. This is the result of not trusting God as we end up with an attitude like this that we're going to pick and choose what we, what we obey. They should have seen the history of how God had always stood by them and pulled them out of the fire every time. But all they could do was look at the people around them and say, they've got it better than I do. You know, we're a strange people. <laughs> we're a strange people. We want God to rid the earth of evil. And all of us have our list, the things that's up the top list. I want God to get rid of that, that group of people. I want God to punish these. And, you know, and, I, and I really don't like that person. And if, if, if we had our wish and God granted our list, we'd see little piles of ashes everywhere where God just went, <laughs> you know, there's nothing but. We're strange people. We want God to rid the earth of evil. But would we be a pile of ashes on somebody else's list? We want God to rid the earth of evil, but we want to hang on to our little slices of evil that we have, that we enjoy in secret or this or that or the other. God, just leave those alone, but get rid of these other things. We want a God of justice who holds people accountable, who punishes people for doing bad things, and we want that to happen. But are you ready for it to happen to you, to me? We're strange when it comes to those things. Have you ever had anybody doubt your love? Have you ever had anybody say, you don't love me, and you know you do? It might have been a spouse. It may have been a child. It may be an adult child that says, you don't love me. Or if you love me, you would do this. Or they, they question your integrity or question your motives. And uh, maybe, maybe it's had, like say, a child a, a child, an adult child, a church, a spouse, somebody's just questioning. And you know how much that hurts is when somebody questions that. This is exactly what God is experiencing because they doubt everything he's told them. Everything he's done for them, and they're saying, it doesn't pay to follow you, God. It just doesn't pay. Doubt and unbelief hurts God, and it cripples us. Hurts God, and it cripples us. Well, we're left with a dilemma here. Uh, go back to the very beginning, Mal Malachi 1, verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. This is how he begins his letter, his a sermon, his address. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? They question his love. Israel has a dilemma. Mankind has a dilemma, and you and I have a dilemma, and this verse, verse points it out. Do we want the love of God? Do we accept the love of God? Are we willing to do the things necessary in our lives to be able to experience 
the love of God. Earlier, earlier in Malachi 3, 7, that first one we read, remember Jesus, uh, the Lord, uh, through Malachi's appeal was, return to me and I'll return to you. They were doing everything right on the outside. But God says, that's not what I want. He says, I want you to return to me wholeheartedly. It didn't work for them. It hasn't worked for anybody else, and it's not going to work for us. Malachi and all the prophets preached repentance as the way to return to him. That's why one week we made such a, we emphasized so much repentance. That is the only way to, to return to God is if we truly repent of our sin and we we realize what a terrible thing we've done and we make that that vow and that promise God I never want to do this to you again I never want to hurt people like this again and we set about our lives in uh, living the very best that we can not to repeat those same sins Jesus when he was very very early in his ministry he said this in Mark chapter 1 verse 15 the time has come he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. You know, if you were sitting here thinking, I'll be so glad when Greg and Eric get off of these prophets, all I'm hearing is about sin and repent and come back. And I'm so ready to get back to Jesus. I got some bad news for you. Jesus said the same thing. Repent, accept the good news. Now, I, I don't know where you are right now. Each of us are in different places as we walk along. I, I, I don't know. You know. For you, it may be stepping out and saying for the very first time, I want to repent of my sins. I want to give my life to, to Christ. I want to be baptized. I want to, I want to follow Christ. For others, it might be that you just need in the privacy of your home or even the public here, the privacy of your home, or you fall down on your knees and you confess to God what you have been holding back from him. And you confess the evil that's in your life and you're ready to let it go. And you repent. <coughs> fully aware, fully exposing to him. Saying it with your mouth. What I've done is wrong and I'm sorry for the hurt I've caused. That may be where you're at. But the truth is this. As Jesus said, the time has come. And it's time to decide. And I hope you don't delay.